Uh, please take a seat, find the book of Genesis chapter 36, and you will find the words we'll be kind of looking at this morning. But of course, before we get to the scripture, we do have a question of the month, and the question of the month goes like this. What is the duty of those who are rightly baptized? In other words, what should they do after they get baptized? Well, it's the duty of those who are rightly baptized to join with a local assembly of believers that they may walk in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord and blamelessly so. So if you get baptized, like next week, joy, not to mention names, that we anticipate that you will then join the body of Christ. So then you can live out a life pleasing unto God because you can't do it without the body of Christ. You cannot be your own private prophet, right? We are here together for a purpose. God has put us together. And so next week we get a baptism coming. This is going to be great. And uh, that person then will be joining us as well as a member in the weeks to come. You know, Edomite culture and even more so even Israeli culture would not really mix well with the Starbucks culture. It just wouldn't. I don't go to Starbucks much because I don't want to waste $10 on a cup of coffee. But you might want to, okay? But not me. Not me. Okay? You can go. I'll stay home. But anyways, I hear that they put your name on the cup so they know it's you. But what happens if you are, your name is like one of the sons of Isaiah? Uh, my name is Mayor Shallow Hashbaz. And you got to put it on the cup. I, I bet you they change your name, Bob. I bet you they do that. I, I, the reason why I say that is because I'm not going to read verses 9 through 34, 43, okay? You can thank me on the way out. I'm just going to read the first eight verses. I will comment on why all those names are there throughout the sermon, but Rachel, on the, on the things, we're going to go verses 1 through 8. So here we go. Hear the word of God from Moses, from God to his people. Isaiah, I mean, Genesis 36, 1 through 8. Now these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Alon the Hittite, and Ahalabama, the daughter of Anna, the granddaughter of Zebion the Hivite, also Basemoth, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. Adam was born Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemoth bore Raul. And Ahalabama bore Jeush and Jalam and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household, his livestock, all his cattle, and all his good, which he had required in the land of Cana. And he went to another land away from his brother Jacob. By the way, he was Israel. For their property had become too great for them to live together, and the land which they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in a hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. That is the word of God. Let's seek his help this morning. Lord, we're asking that by the power of your spirit that these will not just be words, ink, letters on a page, but they will become a life to our souls, a guidance to our hearts. So may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path this morning as we open it up together as your people. Amen. Okay, this is easy. You ready? Two ideas. In the Bible, especially Old Testament, very heavy Old Testament, you get the idea of a kingdom. A kingdom. As you get to the New Testament, it sort of overlaps with the idea of a church. So kingdom and church. You don't find the word kingdom in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, but God said to Adam, have dominion, ha, ha, have a kingdom, have power. And of course, in the Old Testament, kings come along. It's, it's a kingdom. Israel has a kingdom. It's a marked off sphere. And in Old Testament, it was a physical sphere. You knew where the boundaries were, the borders. When you get to the New Testament, Jesus says something like this, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my ecclesia, my called out ones. I'm going to gather them together. And they're not going to be a physical entity. They'll be a spiritual organism known as the church. But they will be a boundary as well. Not a physical boundary, but a gathered people. People who gather together, who love the praises of Jesus. Jesus would say, not forgetting the idea of kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is within you. And even the apostle Paul would say something like this in the book of Colossians, speaking of Jesus, who delivered us 
out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Isn't that great? We were translated from the kingdom of the power of darkness. In other words, we had no taste for heaven's joys. We did not hear what the Spirit was saying. But he's translated us from that kingdom to another kingdom marked off by people who love the things of Christ, who can't live without the things of Christ. They must have the things of Christ, and they love the people of Christ. They must have the people of Christ. So... You were once in darkness. You were born there. I was born there. I didn't see, I didn't hear until God, by his grace, opened my eyes to see the wonderful things of Christ Jesus. The question is, which kingdom are you in this morning? Because we're going to see a great distinction here. We're going to see Esau leaves the presence of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Jacob is the picture of God's presence on earth. Jacob pictures for us the people, the boundaries of who God's people are. And Esau says, I want nothing more to do with you, my friend. I am done with you. We see these great divisions in the book of Genesis. When did we start this, by the way? Does anybody remember 2008, was it? I can't remember. It hasn't been quite that long. But we're getting there. 36 chapters, right? That's over halfway. And you guys have endured so well. Thank you so much. Makes my job a whole lot easier. Anyways, um, yeah, we have light and darkness in the first couple of chapters. The water's above, the water's below. The separation idea going on. We have land and we have sea. We have the sons of man, the sons of God. We have Abraham separated from the people of God. We are from the rest of the world. We have Noah, the same thing. Then we have Ishmael and Isaac. And now we have Esau and we have Jacob. There's a distinction made continually through the book of Genesis. A separation of sorts. And today, unfortunately, Esau, he separates from God's people, and his history's done. That's why in chapter 37, verse 2, we follow the records of God's people, the people of Jacob. The people of Esau are finished. Their names are mentioned. Oh, that's right. They're, they're there, but they just exist. They are not longer, no longer part of the eternal picture. They have no connection with the eternal people who are in Christ Jesus, who, who love the promises of God, who mix faith with the promises of God. No, he wants out. And my doctrine this morning is this. If I leave the church on earth, I lose the church in heaven. If I leave the church on earth, not a church, but the church on earth, I lose the church in heaven. It means I was never really part of it to begin with. And we're going to see that in the life of Esau. Think of his history, what Esau was like, the reason for his leaving, verse 7. They say it's about cattle. I'll talk about that in a minute. But before we even get there, if we, if we look at the history of Esau, it's not a surprise to me that he says, I'm done. I'm finished with you people. I want nothing left to do with the people of God, the people of Christ, the people of promise. I am finished. I am out of here. I'm leaving. That doesn't surprise me at all. Think of his history for a second. First of all, he valued his sensual self, what he felt at any given moment. He valued that far more than the things of his soul. He he valued earthly things far above spiritual privileges. He was out there hunting one day. Remember that day? Went out for the hunt. Didn't come back with anything. His pouch was empty. And he says to his brother, Oh, man, I am famished. I am dying of hunger. He wasn't dying of hunger. It was one one day. Give me a break. Okay? But he says, I'm dying of hunger. Give me some of that porridge that you're making right there. Of course, Jacob, being the wise one, said, trade me your birthright. And what did Esau do? I'm done with the birthright. I have no value in that. I see no value in it. I'm going to trade it for something soulish, for a pot of porridge. And that's what he does. Spiritual privileges. He didn't care for, didn't value them. It's not a surprise that he he ran off. You know, we have an amazing, this, 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 this moment in the name of Jesus is a spiritual privilege beyond privileges. But we don't see it that way sometimes. We are in the house of God with the redeemed of God's people, together. And we're underneath the ministry of the word of God that makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, brings faith to the soul. We, there is a group of people, by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands right this very second who would gladly give up any earthly 
pleasure they ever had to be in your seat right now. Just to have one more chance, just one more chance to sit under the ministry of God's word and to repent and know God savingly. They would give up everything to be where you're sitting right now, those souls that are in hell. They would give it all up just to once more hear the precious truth of Jesus and then respond to it in a saving way. And we're looking at our watches. I hope he's going to be over with soon. Can't wait to get out of here. You know, it's a privilege. Of, and so often we trade it in. Oh, I, I, I need an extra hour to sleep this morning. I'm tired. I, I got a game to go to. Oh, there's that cookout I should. And we, we, we act like these things aren't as powerful and wonderful as they really are. He, he sells his, his birthright to be part of the line of Jesus for a pot of porridge. What do we sell our souls for sometimes? It's not surprising that he leaves. I'm not surprised at all. Second thing about him and his history, before we get to his excuse, he's expressed a love that the most intimate people he is connected with are people outside the promises of God. He marries two women who are not from the people of promise. They are not those who are designated as people who are proper for him to marry, but he marries them anyways. And if my most intimate companions are programming my mind, having the most in intimate input into my soul are people outside of the church, then it's no wonder why he leaves. Packs up all his stuff, all of his goods, all of his servants, and says, I'm done with the church, man. I'm finished. I'm out of here. No wonder. What, that's not surprising to me at all. And then thirdly, you know, he kind of has one foot in the church and one foot in Seir. He kind of goes back and forth. Because when Jacob comes back from the 20-year vacation with Uncle Laban, that wasn't a vacation, by the way. That was supposed to be humorous. You're supposed to laugh. That's good. That's enough. Wasn't that funny? I get you. Okay, 20 years of Laban, okay? He comes back, and he's got to send a letter or a message to Esau, and where Esau is in Seir. Seir is outside the boundaries of the kingdom of Israel, outside of the boundaries of the promised land. He kind of comes back and forth, and, and maybe because dad's still alive, Isaac still loves him, and so, but he's playing this game, and now at this point, he's finished. I'm done. I am completely done with the church. I am leaving. So it doesn't surprise me that I read these verses, and that's what's happening in the life of Esau. You know, when I, was, when I write sermons sometimes, people come to my memory I don't mention names, but they, they come to my memory, and some are, some are good memories, and some are sad memories. And this was a sad one. This young lady consistently resisted the Word of God over and over and over again. All the time. Resist, 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 resist. She decided that after high school and during college that she could marry whoever she wanted. So she did. She, she married a guy from, a, from the Muslim faith. And uh, now she and her children want nothing to do with church. Nothing. She's done. I'm finished. It's over with. That's Esau. Now, the, the excuse that's given is their livestock in verse 7. Okay, maybe in that little small region where they were kind of camping out together, maybe it was kind of tight. But I'm thinking, I read about the promise given to Abraham. Abraham, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. As far as you can see, that's the promise. And it's all yours. And then when Joshua brings... The people of Israel back to Israel, and you read the book of Numbers. How many people are amongst the Israelites? Hundreds of thousands. There are only like maybe 500 people here, and they can't find enough room in the promised land. I wonder if it's just kind of like an excuse maybe because, well, you know, I just don't want to be near them anymore. I don't want to be near the people of promise. You leave the church, my friend. Not, there's reasons to leave a church, okay? But there's never a reason to leave the church, the church of Christ Jesus. You leave the church, you're going to flame out spiritually. I guarantee it. No, remember, remember in the older days we used to, you used to have, a, we have a gas grills now. We're really fancy nowadays. We're so modern. But in the old days we had the thing, the grill with the with the briskets and the thing of oil. You know that thing worked. And you and you then you light the thing on fire. You you burn all the facial hair off your face because you got too close. But if you take one of the briskets and you move it away from the gathered, what happens to that one brisket by itself? Goes out and flames out. You leave the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. You are going to flame out. John Owen 
the Puritan. I love John Owen. I learned so much from him. Um, he writes this. He says, practice strengthens inclination. In other words, the more that I can tell myself that I'm really okay apart from the people of God, I'll deceive myself. And the longer I live in that fashion that I don't need the church, I can do it on my own. The more I live that and convince myself, oh, I'm okay with God. God's okay with me. You'll actually believe that. And you'll be deceived. Esau, I'm done. I am out of here. And if you read verses 9 through 43, which I know you're going to go home today and read that, right? Who's going to read? Never mind, I won't make you lie. Um, it's just an amazing long line of people's names. But you know something? That's all that it is. It's just a bunch of names. It's like they existed and they're done. They have no connection with Jacob, who was Israel, chapter 37, verse 2. They're finished. They just existed. That's all they were. It's like a, a graveyard of verses before us. A bunch of tombstones with just names on it, and that's it. Is that what you want to be? Is that who you want to be? I'm just a name on a tombstone. Well, if you forsake the church of God, the doctrine is real simple. You leave the church of Christ on earth, you lose the church of Christ in heaven. Okay, the extent of his leaving. Look at verse 6. He takes everything with him. I mean, he, he takes everything. All of his livestock, all of his... Why? So he will have no reason to come back to that place ever again. That kingdom, that church that marks out the people of God. I don't want to come back there. I'm taking everything that I have with me because I don't want to cross paths with that place. I wonder what was the... What was the what was that last straw that broke the camel's back for Esau? I wonder what the issue really was. I often wonder, was it the word from God that the older would serve the younger and he couldn't handle that? He couldn't deal with the revelation of God's word over his life that someone else might be calling the shots besides him? And isn't that why some people just say, I'm done. You know, I'm done with that, that book. That thing telling me how to live my life. I'm finished. I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. I'm taking everything that I own and I am leaving. You know, these people that are in this room, the church of Jesus, these are people that are also heavenly travelers walking the pathway that sometimes is narrow and difficult. Difficult, isn't it? Does anybody here think that faith is easy? It hasn't been my, my road. Huh, not at all. Faith is not easy. The people in this room, they are walking that pathway. And I can only guess that Esau said, you know something? I'm done with these people. I, I, I really don't want them anymore. I don't want them to be around anymore. You know, as the head, as Esau makes his decision, I'm finished. I am done with the people of God. I don't want to hear them speak anymore. And my children, I don't want you to do the, the, hear them anymore. You should follow my example. And they did. Esau makes a, a point and he leaves. And guess what? We have the Edomites who are separated from the promises of God. I tell you, when I write a sermon, I've told you before, sometimes a sad story comes to my mind. Sometimes it's a happy story. This is not a happy story. I had a... I had a a few decades ago, a brother, right? he's not a brother really anymore. Um, I thought he might have been. Um, he, he's reformed. He's, I'm, I'm reformed. Oh, great. That's wonderful. I, so my theology, I am too. That's why, where I lean. And, uh, but since I, didn't pre, since I didn't preach election every sermon, he got discouraged. I guess in his mind, that's what being reformed is. It's not what the Bible is, but that's what he wants. And he, and he, and he left. He's gone. He's done. He, not, not with a church. This, he's done with the church. And I, I, I know of his family. And I can tell you this. His children and his grandchildren want nothing to do with the people of promise. Nothing. Their names listed on a piece of paper. They exist, but they have no connection with chapter 37, which is the true picture of those journeying with Jacob, who's Israel. You can't... You can't walk away, Esau. Look at, look, at the, look at the pattern you set. Look what you've done. Look what you set into motion. I'm not sure that man knows what he has done, Esau, but that's what he's done. And he says, and he takes all that he acquired while he was in the promised land. 
In other words, while he was part of the people of God, while he was there, it wasn't like not good things didn't happen. His father loved him. Isaac adored Esau. He did. Isaac loved his son. He loved him more than Jacob. According to the story, he loved him. And so there were good things for Esau there in the boundaries of the kingdom of the church. There were good times. He left with over 400 personnel for, to become an army. He was loved by his father. But isn't that the way sometimes, Christian? Maybe you can relate to this. You spend time with them. You have them over your home. You have fellowship with them, you thought. You shared tears. You shared stories. You've gone on missions trips together. You've been a bond. You thought there was a bond there. And then all of a sudden, it's like... It didn't matter anymore. They're gone. They're gone. And what they're really saying is that you didn't really matter either. I wonder if Isaac felt that about his son. You know, now, 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 that, now that dad's finally gone, Esau takes off. But Esau is back and forth, back and forth. And now Esau leaves the boundaries of the kingdom. He goes to Seir, which is outside the promised land or the land of promise. And he never, never, never returns. You know, I don't know what happened to Esau. For Esau, when he was here, the only time he got uncomfortable was because of Esau. He was his own worst enemy. He caused his own problems. And now he says, I am finished. For all practical spiritual purposes, he was done. And people, they, they benefit sometimes, emotionally, socially, relationally. And yet, when it comes time, I'm done. And I'm done with you people. You, I'm finished. you don't matter to me. I'm finished. And if you leave the church of Christ on earth, you lose the church of Christ in heaven. Period. That's what happens with Esau. He has no love for the things of the Lord. And then the last point is simply this. The place of his leaving, in verse 8, he goes to the country of Seir. Esau is Edom, but he goes to the hill country. It's just not the land outside of the people of God. It's the hill country. I asked the question to myself, could Esau, could have Esau handled being Israel? Because Jacob is now Israel. Think of what Jacob went through. Think of what God put Jacob through. Remember what Paul said to, was it Ananias? I will, I will, I will show Paul, God says, how much he must suffer for my namesake. Do you think that Esau could have suffered what Jacob suffered and taken the name Israel? I don't think he could have. If he quits now, he certainly couldn't have handled all of that pressure put upon Jacob's shoulder to learn what it means to be God's servant, to be Israel. You read through, you read through the names here, and uh, you find some interesting thoughts here. If you read, when you go home, and you read verses 9 through 43, which I know you've already promised you will, so now you're going to have to. What you're going to notice is this. They were, they were chiefs. They were chiefs, man. And they were, they were kings. And, and, and they reigned. But not for the eternal world. But for the temporal world. And I got to wonder about Esau. Was that really what it was all about? It was just about titles. And he couldn't deal with the fact that his brother was going to be the one holding the title and not him. Do you, do you realize that the kings and queens of England don't actually run England? Do you realize that? Okay, good, good, because they don't. They're just like figureheads. They really don't, they don't really set anything in motion. These people listed, and there's lots of names there that you and I probably can't pronounce very well, but that's okay, and you're not going to find most of those names on a Starbucks cup. But anyways, they accomplish nothing. Nothing for eternity. They're just listed as existing, and that's it. And maybe they were in love with titles as well. You know, we live in a culture that's just enamored with titles. How many more award shows are they going to have in this country? We have the Oscars, we have the Emmys, the ESPYs, the, uh, the people's... I don't even know the end of it. How many, how many more events must there be so people can have their picture taken at the red carpet so they feel good about themselves? But they love titles. And now even... And I know, why, I know why they're doing this. I know that football teams are having their own Hall of Fame so they can thank the players that made their team successful in that thing called sports. I understand it. But titles after titles after titles, that's all that is there. I wonder if that was the thing that drove Esau to say, I'm done. 
They didn't treat me the way I wanted to be treated. I'm done with the people of God. I quit. I am finished. And then where does he go? He goes to a place far in the hill country of Seir. Why do you go to the mountains? To get away from what? People. Yeah, you get away from people. You ever hear that little saying? I love church, but it's just the people I can't stand. You know? Well, <laughs> you might want to work through your theology because that's really upside down. Okay? But he goes to the mountains. Isby, which is the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Isn't that funny? Isby. Um, calls this mountain. It's a mountainous tract. It's a range of mountains noted for their wooded heights. You go there so you purposely will not run into one of the people of promise. I take all my stuff, all my goods, and I'm finished. I am done. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to be bothered with that stuff. I don't want them to convict me with their words. I just, I'm done. I, I got a friend who's, he's got to sell this because he's older now, but he owns a cabin on the East Haven Mountain in Vermont. I told you this before. It's a wonderful hike up. It takes about almost two hours to get up there. Um, and you have to hike all your water, all your food, everything up. And we hiked up there one winter. It was uh, early February. Um, base of the mountain was like 15 degrees. Get to the top of the mountain, it's like 10 below. And I'm sweating 10 below. Because you're hiking up, up, and you get all your water and your food. And, uh, but you, you don't go there to see Uncle Joe, okay, or cross paths with Sister Mary. Um, you go there to get away. The only thing you're going to meet up there is a moose, a bear, or a deer, or a pheasant, or a grouse, or something else like that. But you're not going to meet people. All the times I went up there, it was never like, hey, there's so-and-so. There's nobody up there. It's isolation. Esau, I'm going to the hill country, not just to Seir, but I'm going to the mountain range, so I will not cross paths with my brother or my brother's people who happen to be the people of promise. I want nothing to do with them ever again. My goodness. I guess I have to ask for one question I'd like to ask Esau is this. How bad was it to be near your father and your brother? Was it really that horrible that you would leave like that, the people of promise? You know, something happens. And it's just not, there's a spiritual dynamic that takes place. When someone decides in their mind that I'm finished with the church of Jesus Christ. Again, it's not leaving a church, it's leaving the church. There are legitimate reasons that sometimes people have to leave a church to go to another one. That happens. But when I leave the church of Jesus Christ, there's a spiritual thing that's taking place. I'm saying to myself that I never knew Christ. I was never awakened by His Spirit. I was never regenerated. I never saw the things I said that I saw. I only tasted a little bit of some good things, but I never made them part of who I was. It's the church of Jesus. And Esau says, I'm finished. And I'm going away as far as possible. You know, I cross paths sometimes with people. There's a couple that left Austin Square. How dare they? Oh, those bad people. Now, they're not bad people. They felt at that time it was best for them to go to a different place. And they went to a good place. I know the pastor. So when I see that couple, it's just kind of normal. Hey, how's it going? How's the pastor? We talk. We talk. Because they're still in the church of Jesus Christ. But what happens when I leave the church and you see them at the grocery store? You know what it's like? Oh, I hope the pastor doesn't make eye contact with me. Oh, I don't want to talk to him. Oh boy, I don't want to deal with that. And I don't want, I don't want to be involved with the people anymore. I want to be separate from them. And, and, and that's what happens. Esau, he leaves the boundaries of the promised land, the kingdom, the marked out place. In that case, it was a physical thing. He goes to Seir, and he never comes back. Never comes back. You leave the church of Christ on earth. You lose the church of Jesus Christ in heaven. Okay? And there's a practical thing there, too. You need to be in the church of Jesus Christ on earth. Okay? You just need to be with God's people. So far, if you came to church this morning... And you've been, you say, let's say you got here early and uh, you got here at 10.15. You've been here a little bit over an hour. Are you, are you hanging in there? Are you, are you holding on? Are you, are you going to make it? We're almost done. And we're going to land the plane, as Pastor Nick would say. Are you fit? We're almost finished. I mean, was it really that troubling to be with God's people, to sing God's praise, to hear the, was it really that burdensome? I'll leave you with this tale of two, two families. 
This one family I have, I've known for decades, um, we thought they were in. I thought they were part of the people of God. And, uh, and they're not anymore. And uh, like the other person I mentioned, they, he, he decided that he was done. And he sent the message to all his children and now his grandchildren that this is the biggest waste of time. This is the most foolish thing you could ever do. And uh, their family doesn't go to church. Those grandkids have no idea at all who Jesus is. They may have something made up in their mind as their own private version of Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. And uh, I think, oh no, it's Esau. I'm done. I'm finished. That, those people, that word, those promises, I can't believe that. I'm finished. Then I had another brother. And this is several decades. We're going back four decades now, which means I've been here a long I've been in this thing for a long time. And uh, his name is Phil. He doesn't know that I'm speaking of him now, but hopefully he... I know a lot of Phil, so he doesn't have to worry. He struggled. He and his wife, they... Reformed theology was really deep for them, so that they really had to battle through it, but they stuck with it for years. I mean, decades now. Decades, decades. And uh, I, I follow his son... I follow them, too, on, on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook a whole lot. Every once in a while, I just check. Oh, yeah, there's so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that his grandchildren, his grandchildren are pursuing the things of eternity. You know, he never just went, I'm done here. I'm finished. No, the one thought he was something really big and huge, and the other one just, was just trying to make, and just trying to figure it all out, and his children are, and grandchildren are serving and, and loving and knowing, and you know, if you, if you give up, if you leave the church of Jesus on earth, you're going to lose the church of Jesus in heaven. I hate to say that this morning, but that's what the verses are telling me. I don't know what else to tell you from those verses. It can't be happy sermon time, okay? I think it's sort of gut check time that, yeah, Esau, you, you, you just left. And it doesn't surprise me that he left because he never showed any love or passion for the things of God. He was not marked off as one of God's children. I pray that you are marked off and this is going to be who you are until your last dying breath. That you will hold on with all your spiritual strength the things of eternity in Jesus Christ and you will never, ever, ever lose heart to the point that you give up because you don't want to be Esau, okay? You want to be with Jacob, who is Israel. Jacob was not a perfect man, but he was God's man. We are not a perfect people, but we are God's people. To the praise of his glorious grace, let's pray. God, thanks for loving us and putting up with us, and uh, your long suffering is wonderful. Hear us now as we sing one last song, Almighty God, to your Son Jesus, through the power of your Spirit. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.